Welcome. This is part one of The Bass, the River, and Sheila Mant by W.D. Wetherell. There was a summer in my life when the only creature that seemed lovelier to me than a largemouth bass was Sheila Mant. I was 14. The Mants had rented the cottage next to ours on the river. With their parties, their frantic games of softball, and their constant comings and goings, they appeared to me denizens of a brilliant existence. Too noisy by half, my mother quickly decided. But I would have given anything to be invited to one of their parties. And when my parents went to bed, I would sneak through the woods to their hedge and stare enchanted at the candlelight swirl of white dresses and bright paisley skirts. Sheila was the middle daughter. At 17, all but out of reach. She would spend her days sunbathing on a float my Uncle Seabird had moored in their cove. And before July was over, I had learned all her moods. If she lay flat on the diving board with her hand trailing idly in the water, she was pensive, not to be disturbed. On her side, her head propped up by her arm, she was observant, considering those around her with a look that seemed queenly and severe. Sitting up, arms tucked around her long suntan legs, she was approachable, but barely. And it was only in those glorious moments when she stretched herself prior to entering the water that her various suitors found the courage to come near. These were many. The Dartmouth heavyweight crew would scull by her house on their way up river. And I think all eight of them must have been in love with her at various times during the summer. The coxswain would curse them through his megaphone, but without effect. There was always a pause in their pace when they passed Sheila's float. I suppose to these jaded 20-year-olds, she seemed the incarnation of innocence and youth, while to me she appeared unutterably suave, the epitome of sophistication. I was on the swim team at school, and to win her attention, I would do endless laps between my house and the Vermont shore, hoping she would notice the beauty of my flutter kick, the power of my crawl. Finishing, I would boost myself up onto our dock and glance casually over toward her, but she was never watching. And the miraculous day she was, I immediately climbed the diving board and did my best tuck and a half for her and continued diving until she had left and the sun went down and my longing was like a madness and I couldn't stop. All right, so in the story, we have uh, our, our narrator, he is a 14 year old boy and he is uh, a bit infatuated with the 17 year old girl next door, all right? Uh, he's uh, kind of studied her over the summer. He's, you know, as he's outside doing things, he notices her constantly. And uh, he kind of, you know, breaks down all that he's seen. Now he's not alone. Uh, it was just talking about that paragraph that the Dartmouth Skull crew, which is the rowing team, when they would go by, you know, going down the river, they would all stop and stare at Sheila Mint. So uh, he's not alone in this sort of infatuation. And, um, you know, th this, you know, is a sort of normal 14 year old obsession. All right. Um, but he's certainly feeling like it's sincere in his mind. Obviously, it is sincere in his mind. All right. So let's see. What comes of this? It was late August by the time I got up the nerve to ask her out. The tortured will eyes, won't eyes, the agonized indecision over what to say, the false starts toward her house and embarrassed retreats. The details of these have been seared from my memory. And the only part I remember clearly is emerging from the woods toward dusk while they were playing softball on their lawn, as bashful and frightened as a unicorn. Sheila was stationed halfway between first and second, well outside the infield. She didn't seem surprised to see me. As a matter of fact, she didn't seem to see me at all. If you're playing second base, you should move closer, I said. She turned. I took the full brunt of her long red hair and well-spaced freckles. I'm playing outfield, she said. I don't like the responsibility of having a base. Yeah, I can understand that, I said, though I couldn't. There's a band in Dixford tomorrow night at nine. Want to go? One of her brothers sent the ball sailing over the left fielder's head. She stood and watched it disappear toward the river. You have a car? She said without looking up. I played my master stroke. We'll go by canoe. I spent all the following day polishing it. I turned it upside down on our lawn. All 
and rubbed every inch with Brillo, hosing off the dirt, wiping it with chamois until it gleamed as bright as aluminum ever gleamed. About five, I slid it into the water, arranging cushions near the bow so Sheila could lean on them if she was in one of her pensive moods, propping up my father's transistor radio by the middle thwart so we could have music when we came back. Automatically, without thinking about it, I mounted my Mitchell reel on my Fluger spinning rod and stuck it in the stern. I say automatically because I never went anywhere that summer without a fishing rod. When I wasn't swimming laps to impress Sheila, I was back in our driveway practicing casts. And when I wasn't practicing casts, I was tying the line to Tosco or Springer Spaniel to test the reel's drag. When I wasn't doing any of those things, I was fishing the river for bass. Too nervous to sit at home, I got in the canoe early and started paddling in a huge circle that would get me to Sheila's dock around eight. As automatically as I brought along my rod, I tied on a big Rapula plug, let it down into the water, let out some line, and immediately forgot all about it. All right, so he's going to pick up Sheila. He asked her out. She agrees. And when he gets into the canoe, he goes through his normal fishing routine. He sets everything up, ties on uh, the, the weight and the lure, and he it puts it in the water, prepared to catch a fish. All right, so he just kind of does this automatically. It's just he's not really like fishing. He's just kind of it's there. And he's, uh, you know, just trying to do something because his nerves are getting to him because he's got a big date. And that makes sense. So let's see how this big date goes. It was already dark by the time I glided up to the manse dock. Even by day, the river was quiet. Most of the summer, people preferring Sun and Pier, one of the other nearby lakes. And at night, it was a solitude difficult to believe. A corridor of hidden life that ran between banks like a tunnel. Even the stars were part of it. They weren't as sharp anywhere else. They seemed to have chosen the river as a guide on their slow wheel tour morning. And in the course of the summer's fishing, I had learned all their names. I was there 10 minutes before Sheila appeared. I heard the slam of their screen door first, then saw her in the spotlight as she came slowly down the path. As beautiful as she was on the float, she was even lovelier now. Her white dress went perfectly with her hair and complimented her figure even more than her swimsuit. It was her face that bothered me. It had on its delightful fullness a very dubious expression. Look, she said, I can get dad's car. It's faster this way, I lied. Parking's tense up there. I think it's safe. I won't tip it or anything. She let herself down reluctantly into the bow. I was glad she wasn't facing me. When her eyes were on me, I felt like diving in the river again from agony and joy. I pried the canoe away from the dock and started paddling upstream. There was an extra paddle in the bow, but Sheila made no move to pick it up. She took her shoes off and dangled her feet over the side. Ten minutes went by. What kind of band, she said. It's sort of like folk music. You'll like it. Eric Aswell is going to be there. He strokes number four. No kidding, I said. I had no idea whom she meant. What's that sound, she said, pointing toward shore. Bass, that splashing sound? Over there. Yeah, bass. They come into the shallows at night to chase frogs and moths and things. Big large mouths. Microopterus salamoides, I added, showing off. I think fishing's dumb, she said, making a face. I mean, it's boring and all. Definitely dumb. Now, I have spent a great deal of time in the years since, wondering why Sheila Manch should come down so hard on fishing. Was her father a fisherman? Her antipathy toward fishing? Nothing more than normal filial rebellion? Has she tried it once? A messy encounter with worms? It doesn't matter. What does is at that fragile moment in time, I would have given anything not to appear dumb in Sheila's severe and unforgiving eyes. She hadn't seen my equipment yet. What I should have done, of course, was push the canoe in closer to shore and carefully slide the rod into some branches where I could pick it up again in the morning. Failing then, I could have surreptitiously dumped the whole outfit overboard, written off the 40 or so dollars as love's tribute. What I actually did do was gently lean forward and slowly, ever so slowly, push the rod back through my legs toward the stern, where it would be less conspicuous. It must have been just exactly what the bass was waiting for. 
Fish will trail a lure sometimes, trying to make up their mind whether or not to attack. And the slight pause in the plug speed caused by my adjustment was tantalizing enough to overcome the bass's inhibitions. My rod, safely out of sight at last, bent double. The line, tightly coiled, peeled off the spool with the shrill tearing zip of a high-speed drill. Four things occurred to me at once. One, that it was a bass. Two, that it was a big bass. Three, that it was the biggest bass I had ever hooked. Four, that Sheila Mant must not know. All right, so we're going to pause there for part one. He had the fishing gear set up. She calls fishing stupid. He hooks the bass while he's trying to hide the fishing rod from her because he doesn't want her to think that he's an idiot or that he's dumb, as she called fishing. And in the process of doing that, he managed to hook what he believes is the largest bass he's ever hooked. We'll see how the date goes from here in part two.